we're taken by a Golf GTD uh, diesel. Watch the clock ticking off the wall But tonight I'm letting it go Spend my coin for Or I could be someone else No one stopping now Hi guys and welcome back to the channel It's been a while If you don't know me, my name is Jack Hi, uh, check my Instagram, it's going to be on the screen now I am in the Abarth 595 competition, eh? And it's just popped over 15,000 miles. So, I thought it'd be a perfect time to show you what it's like to live with this car. Um, I don't want to do a, you know, the, I don't want to do a review, I don't want anything about it. I just kind of want to show you guys uh, what I kind of experienced when I've been living with it. Uh, just things I kind of picked up that I think you probably experience and kind of want to know before you buy one of these cars or if you're living with it. It'd be interesting to see if you experience it as well. Um, so yeah, well, let's have a look. What I have learned living with this car is actually it does want you to drive a little bit faster and like a hot hatch. Put it in the sport, it just look. It just wants you to go. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, it just. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure on the brakes. To be honest, that's one thing. Is they are super sketchy. One thing I really like about uh, the 595 is actually the fuel economy. Uh, now, at the moment, I'm doing 33 point something miles per gallon. Uh, earlier, I was doing 12 uh, when I had my foot down, but actually, it averages about like 40 or something miles per gallon, which is actually, hello, Mini, actually really quite good. Um, and for a little car with a little 1.4 and 180 brake horsepower, or whatever it is, it's actually pretty cool and it's, it's economical. Uh, the automatic gearbox, I don't know if that helps or not with the economy, I don't know, but it's not it's not that expensive to run. And actually, when you fill it up, it's maybe like 30, 40 quid uh, at the most, and you get, I don't know, good three or 400 miles out of it so yeah I think it's pretty pretty good right with my John Cooper works I have gone through five tires one wheel four brake pads and a few dents have been taken out which is going maybe like I don't know 60 50 quid a pop hello mini I love you I love you John Cooper works love it and um, yeah I've gone through quite a lot in this car nothing no tires no broken alloys um Actually, wear and tear wise, absolutely fine. Now, yes, I drive my John Cooper Works more than I drive this car. I'm not the only one who drives this car, and this car does go all over the place. So, different people using it, maybe this has got a hard life than my John Cooper Works because I'm consistent. However, I do more miles in the John Cooper Works. So, take that how you will, but just off the basis that I drive this on the same roads, same kind of times every so often, and this has got no punctures, nothing, no broken blowouts, but my John Cooper Works has had a lot and cost a load of money. That's one good thing to consider. So, um, on the daily drive, depends on what you're used to and what you'd need, but no cruise control. Um, now, I did have a look through, please someone don't shout at me if I get it wrong, but I'm pretty sure you can't get cruise control on the newer bar, the 595, 695, I'm pretty sure you can't get it, which is interesting, uh, because I do use my John Cooper Works adapter cruise control every day. I don't drive without it, basically, it's, it's awesome. So. That's an interesting one. I, I'm always checking that clock, making sure I'm doing the right speed limit because um, I don't want to get caught. So that's one thing. Uh, if, you, that's, if that's a die must, then obviously don't buy the car. Not adaptive suspension. Yeah, it's pretty hard. Ah, the seats, they don't go up and down. How about that? The back of it, backwards and forwards, front slide backwards and forwards, but it doesn't go up or down, which is very, very interesting. Oh. Maybe it's because of the um, the bucket seats, maybe the other ones you can do, but these ones you can't, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and actually these are basically like planks of wood with bits of uh, vinyl strapped to them, uh, which is again, uh, not great. However, oh, I kind of love these. However, um, a lot of people do have them and um, well, I mean, it's absolutely fine. I've got used to it. So I think it's probably a get used to rather than a don't buy it because they've got them. I think you'll just get used to them in due course. I definitely have, uh, which is good. Here's one. Now, if you imagine a bus uh, and you imagine the steering wheel, you know when the kind of steering wheel kind of drives like that, 
Well, this car, because of the way, actually, let's, let's just go back a little, a, a little bit. Um, small cars, because they're quite squished, they haven't got loads of room inside. Um, one, obviously, one big thing that came from Minis was that everyone started to put their engines transversely, right? So they would put their engines mounted sideways uh, to save room. So you could then push everything up, have a bigger cabin, and push the wheels to the outside, which is a great idea. It's um, something that I believe came from, well, I know the Mini was uh, was one to revolutionize that. Um, so when it comes to this car, it's a transverse engine mounted sideways, so you've got lots of room. However, in a bigger car, if you imagine the steering rack, the big kind of, well, not the steering rack, the steering thingy, the little thing, the steering, column, ah, technical, steering column, um, comes out, right? Now, if you have a big car, it can actually come out quite flat, which means when the steering wheel is built it on, hang on two seconds, it's quite flat, right? So it fits like flat, so you can then drive like you're driving a car, like it's flat to you. Um, but in, say the Mini, uh, or for example, this car, and the older Mini, not my Mini, but the older Mini, and this car, because you haven't got much room, this steering column has to go up a little bit, because obviously it's squished up. But then the steering wheel doesn't come then come out like at an angle like that. That would work. It has to come kind of perpendicular, perpen, perpendic, perpendicular, perpendicular, has to come out like that. So with that theory, because the steering column is up more, the steering wheel, instead of looking flat at you, starts to bend. So actually, back to my bus analogy. It almost does feel like you're driving like a bus, which is very, very interesting. I had a Q3 a long time ago when I worked at Audi, and actually that was very, very similar. The steering wheel was kind of flat almost, and it didn't give me the kind of confidence that I could strap into this car and drive it quickly. Now this car, again, don't get me wrong, you can drive it quickly, but because of that steering wheel, it's a really, really weird, subtle thing. I don't know if a lot of other people find it, but because it is a little bit flatter, it just doesn't feel like I can drive it and, and kind of I'm with the car as much as say my John Cooper works or some other cars. So I hope you follow me, I hope you understand that. Um, but yeah, that's just one thing that I have learned. Uh, and Which is fine though, if you're gonna be cruising around on the motorway or just in traffic, it's absolutely fine. But when you do one of those little blasts, like more often than not I do in this car, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. So, the automatic gearbox. Well, it's not to everyone's taste. Uh, to be honest, it's actually not really to mine. I should have driven it before uh, buying the car. But, oh, Apple Watch, what's up, bro? Um, but, um, again, I think this is all a situation of what you're used to. Because actually for this, because of the cars I've driven in the past, uh, this automatic gearbox is awful. However, I've been very much well informed by that was a better one. No, it wasn't. Uh, very much well informed by people behind my uh, behind my computer street on YouTube and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. You lovely people have been telling me that this is not a ordinary uh, gearbox. It's uh, an MTA, a manual transmission automated. Uh, it's not. You should never use it as a. I consider it as an automatic gearbox. It's just basically a manual that's automated. So you don't have to use a clutch, but it's very simple uh, and it's very. It does the job basically. It, it just does the job. Um, and that is exactly what it does. At the moment, I'm driving. It does the job. When I brake for a roundabout at some point soon, uh, I don't have to worry about changing down and accelerating again. Don't have to worry about changing backing it, uh, which is fine uh, on the motorway. Again, you can sit there and cruise, but then again argument you can cruise on the motorway in, in a manual um, but yeah it's um it's one of those ones that if you're used to a really good say double clutch or a an Audi a VW or something gearbox uh, then actually you'd probably be a little bit disappointed having not done research into what this gearbox actually is uh, but if you take it as face value that it's not a proper automatic it's just an automated manual type box system then you know what it's absolutely fine uh, it does a job and uh, yeah basically. So, why don't I summarise uh, living with this car? I mean, yeah, it's just over 15,000 miles on the clock. Uh, had it a few months now. And, yeah, living with it is pretty good. Um, you've, if you haven't seen a lot of my other videos, uh, some of the reviews, some of the looking at the gearbox, then have a look, because I do go in a little bit more depth of what I actually think of uh, the actual engineering and actual car itself. Uh, in more detail. But, um, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. It's been, uh, it's been nice to get out in the sun. 
Um, but I think it's time for me to wrap up there. Uh, make sure to subscribe to your future videos, it'd be really, really appreciated. Uh, but for now, I'll see you soon.